it has this potential, this ego dissolving kind of potential that you have to pay attention to, you have to be there for it, and it's a, um, an energy medicine. You open the body and the mind and the body open together. If you can quiet the mind, if you can create those gaps and just really pay attention, really feel that presence and just enter more deeply into now. You are now listening to the Soul and Wonder Podcast, Episode 71, Cannabis and Spirituality, Part 1, with Stephen Gray. Welcome to the Soul and Wonder Podcast, where the conduits of the body, depths of the mind, and atlas of the soul are explored with devotion. Through cultural exchange, Christopher and Sarah and their guests will deliver sacred wisdom from around the globe. Uncovering the hidden gems of conscious living and holistic healing, all to empower you on your journey of self-discovery. And now, here are your hosts, Christopher and Sarah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Soul and Wonder podcast. We are so happy to have you here today for another wonderful episode with Stephen Gray. But before we get into this interview and talk a little bit about Stephen, we do encourage you, please, if you do love the podcast, if you've been listening, please share with your friends and family. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and all the other platforms that we're on. And please share when you can. Uh, It helps to spread the word about the podcast, helps us to get guests that you guys want, that you guys want to hear onto the show. So um, please do that when you can. And you can also um, share with your friends on Instagram. We are at Soul in Wonder Love and on Facebook at Soul in Wonder Inc. So we are very excited for this interview today with Stephen Gray. And if you've never heard of Stephen, he is a teacher a writer on spiritual subjects and sacramental medicines, and he has worked extensively with Tibetan Buddhism, the Native American church, and with several ethnogenic medicine paths. Stephen is the author of Returning to Sacred World, a spiritual toolkit for emerging reality, and editor and contributor for Cannabis and Spirituality, an explorer's guide to ancient plant spirit ally. He is also a conference, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, and workshop organizer, leader, and speaker, as well as a part-time photographer and music composer under the artist named Kiri, that is K-E-A-R-Y. Stephen lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. I don't think we've ever had a conversation about cannabis with someone so eloquent on the subject matter, so educated. He just conveys all of the points that Christopher and I feel within ourselves when we commune with the plant and so much more. He goes into a lot of depth. And, you know, whatever your opinion is on cannabis, I would like to invite you to approach this interview with an open mind, whether you are a regular user, whether you're, you've used it once and you're afraid of it, or maybe you have these judgments of those people who do use cannabis. Maybe you've never tried it at all. I don't know where you're at in your life, but I want to encourage you to approach this with an open mind, absorb every word that Stephen has to say. We're going to be talking about the stigmatization of cannabis over the last century especially in the Western world. We're going to talk about the misinterpretation of the plant in spiritual communities and the dogma that has perpetuated the stigmatization of the medicine. We're also going to go into the various ways in which cannabis can be used as a powerful spiritual medicine ally. And Anxiety, fear, paranoia, have you ever experienced that while you've smoked or taken oil? We're going to talk about why someone might be experiencing these things while using cannabis and how they can use it to their advantage for spiritual healing. And of course, we'll tie it up with the future of cannabis and the dire state in which humanity and the earth depend on our ability to wake up and commune with nature in a balanced, harmonious way. We'll be diving into a wide variety of topics in and outside of what I've just mentioned as well. And we've also decided to make this a part one because there's a lot that we didn't have enough time to talk about that we believe is crucial for the repair of the perception of this plant in our spiritual communities, our spiritual growth, personal growth, etc. So part two will be coming up hopefully sooner than later. (laughs) 
Welcome back, everybody. We're really excited. We've got Stephen here with us. Stephen, you have such a calm voice. <laughs> I have to say that. You have a great radio voice. Oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> you, you know, we never know until we have our guest on, and uh-huh. it's just perfect for a podcast. So welcome to the Soul Wonder Podcast. We're really happy that you've decided to share this space with us. Yeah, no problem. Glad to. So, Stephen, let's just dive right into this subject because we've got a lot of things that we'd like to cover and hear your interpretation of, your beliefs, etc. And so, obviously, the use of cannabis has been heavily stigmatized in many cultures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is also accepted in many places, but it still seems to be misunderstood, even in a lot of the spiritual community or communities. So. What do you think is the reason for this confusion or misinterpretation of the plant? Hmm. Well, um, probably a, at least a couple of things. The first one that comes to mind is uh, is that you know since the 1930s, it's been vilified by uh, you know cultural influencers, you know, a government, you know policing authorities and whatnot. I mean, they really did a job on poor old cannabis back in the 1930s. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, there was a new um, uh, a new organization called the uh, FBN, I think, in the United States, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Um, I think that was what later became the DEA. In any case, it was started, or the first head of it was a guy named Harry J. Anslinger. And um, I think he was a bit of a nutcase, like these people often are, you know, the <laughs> Edgar J. Hoover's of the world and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. And he, uh, he, uh, the story I've read about him was he was looking for, um, uh, he wanted to get this organization really rolling, and he was looking for funding. He needed a, you know, a, a cause celeb, you know, and uh, so he picked cannabis. And I'm not can't remember exactly why and then just went about vilifying it and there were a lot of other you know complicit actors in this William Randolph Hearst who owned the newspaper the San Francisco Examiner I think it was called um, got got on board with all this Uh, 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 somebody told me recently that uh, he also owned uh, a bunch of uh, forest land that uh, they wanted to use for the, the newsprint for their paper that had been previously using hemp I can't verify that just somebody told me that. But in any case, there was a terrible vilification campaign that went on starting in around that time in the United States, I'm talking about in particular. And, uh, uh, excuse me, and they, they, you know, it was, it was racist, it was, um, uh, you know, classist, racist, uh, you know, they painted these people as criminals. They, they were doing a lot of public uh, advertising to say that it was more addictive than heroin, mm. um, just a lot of complete nonsense, you know, so that kind of got in there. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of wormed its way into the culture. It goes back before that, of course. I mean, basically, the 20th century has been hard on cannabis, and not just cannabis, but natural substances altogether, um, natural plants. You know, uh, the sort of uh, reification of, of science and uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, getting involved and so on and so on. Um, and so, natural medicines. You know, that's a whole story in itself. Cannabis is really a remarkable medicine, but it's just one of a great many plant medicines on this planet that people have used for probably millennia, you know, um, for, um, you know, very various medicinal reasons. And uh, these dominant cultures uh, out of Europe in particular, originally, you know, um, as they went around the world, they just didn't understand these cultures. They were so arrogant. They thought they just knew everything. And they primitive peoples knew nothing um so th- th- so that's been a big part of it. it you know that started i think you know in the late 1900s there started to be a lot more action against cannabis in various places uh, india there's there's a wonderful um report it's one of the best reports i believe um that's ever been done on cannabis it's called the indian india or indian hemp drugs commission report of 1893-94 and the british government commissioned uh, you know people probably know the brits were in there for a couple of hundred years took over the country claimed it was mm-hmm. their own there's not talk about arrogance huh mm-hmm. oh, yeah we'll make this count our country you know oh there's only to, you know 100 million people living here already uh well anyway um uh 
you know, cannabis use was very prevalent in India up to that time, and they commissioned this report, which basically said it's fine, and it, you know, it's a, it, um, uh, it's there's no social harm caused by it, and it has medicinal benefits and spiritual benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all that, and then just one other thing that occurs to me as to you know the, the sort of the sullied reputation of the plant is. Uh, is it's, uh, it's sort of in the media and in culture, you know, its association with the sort of um, uh, stoner uh, making you dumb kind of idea, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, like the, Duh, what were we just talking about, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so people have thought of it as a sort of a dumbing down substance. And this is what we should probably get into at some point. You're welcome to go back to your, your you know, preferred questions for a while, but um, it, it actually is an advanced spiritual medicine in that way because there's a huge difference between, um, you know, not understanding how to use this plant um, and understanding what it's really capable of. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And if I'm not mistaken, before this time period of the 1920s, before this vilification of the plant, uh-huh. there was, it was being used in, in, definitely Western cultures as medicine. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely. You could go into any pharmacy or apothecary or whatever they called them back then. And they had all kinds of different preparations. They, uh, you know, big companies like Park and Davis, you know, um, were, were selling, you know, different kinds of tinctures and things like that. Oh yeah. I know it was in the, I don't know the exact timelines, but definitely the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, uh, it's well, it, it wasn't just that it. Uh, I, I've read somewhere that it wasn't just that there was this vilification campaign against it. It was also that new medicines, other medicines, were starting to be developed um, and people were starting to lose a degree of interest in cannabis. But it was definitely you know, legal or no one had ever made an attempt to illegalize it. And yeah, all kinds of people used it. Mother's little helper, whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And it was something you said really stuck out to me. You said mm-hmm. when the plant is used properly, mm-hmm. it can be a powerful spiritual medicine ally. Mm-hmm. And I would like to open up this you know, space for you to explain the different ways in which cannabis can be used as that spiritual medicine ally and Mm -hmm. what exactly is the proper way to quote unquote use Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Well, there isn't just one proper way to be specific about it, but uh, uh, let me just draw an analogy for a moment first. Um, I've been around a number of the uh, psychedelic uh, sacramental medicines and, um, like ayahuasca, for example, uh, I've you know done that one a fair amount over the years, and for about a dozen years, uh, I was a frequent uh, visitor to. Um, I say visitor because I was outside the culture mostly, but um, uh, Native American church peyote prayer ceremonies. I used to go to, probably went to thirty or forty of them over a course of about a dozen years, and. Um, in both with both those medicines in ceremonial environments, which was always where I took them, um, uh, the people who'd been around them for quite a while tended not to vomit or throw up or purge or in the Native American church they call it getting well. Um, you know, uh, it was the it was the new people, the people unfamiliar with the with the substances and 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 how to handle it that would tend to get sick and dizzy and all these sort of things, you know. Um, so it's about learning uh, this is where the analogy comes back to cannabis. Um, it's uh, it cannabis has that quality as well. Uh, it, you know the uh, psychedelics are often referred to as ego dissolvers, mm-hmm. um, potential, potential, uh, not, not by any means always. And again, it has to do with that p- possibility also has to do with how you use it and how you understand the, the substance, but substances, but I would put can- cannabis in the same category, essentially. Uh, you know, people tend to think of it as milder, but it can be, uh, you know, right up there. People have said that, uh, um, uh, I mean, I've experienced some pretty powerful things, both uh, in, in you know in my personal experience and in the ceremonies that I lead. Uh, and I've heard of uh, you know other ways of doing it that people have you know even gone 
deeper than that in a sense. Like uh, I, uh, I recently wrote a foreword for a book by Daniel McQueen that's coming out sometime in the next few months called Psychedelic Cannabis. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's been working with cannabis for years. And he, he, the way, I won't go into it, but he has a whole method. He combines different strains and he does breath work, like the holotropic breath work stuff and all that. And wow. he's, he says that, you know, he has people come up to him after the end of his ceremonies and say, well, I've done DMT and this is right up there with that, mm. you know? Yeah. So, wow. So, oh man, <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch of factors involved that we could also talk about. There's, you know, there's ways to do it, but there's also issues of, you know, the method of intake and dosage and all that kind of stuff. So basically, to you know, to pr try to come back to some sort of simple answer to your question, Sarah, uh, about uh, the best way or the appropriate way. Um, uh, here's 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 a crude admonition from uh, Terence McKenna: Sit down, shut up, and pay attention. <laughs> you know, um, I love it. You ha um, you know he was talking about major psychedelics, but the same thing applies because and, and as almost especially with cannabis. And again, I'm comparing it to the other psychedelics like ayahuasca and uh, peyote and so on. Is you know in a sizable dose, they pretty much grab you by the short hairs and say. I don't care what you think, you're coming with me, um, <laughs> right? Um, yep. You don't really have a choice. You know, you can either, if you resist, you're going to have a hell of a hard time. If you let go, you're going to have a very powerful experience. And you very well, very well may have an extremely powerful experience even if you resist. It's just not going to let you go. Um, cannabis, except in the, the really higher dose situations, this is what kind of makes it a little tricky for people to understand its potential is you can miss that. Um, if you busy your mind um, and busy yourself with activity, uh, like I, I, I notice this just myself. I, I tend to, well, just for what it's worth and not, I'm not, this is not a pros, uh, prescription that anyone else necessarily should follow, but, I usually try to use cannabis twice a week, um, and uh, part of the reason twice a week uh, is that uh, one of those times, not every weekend, is my friend, uh, a friend of mine comes over and we play music together, and we have some cannabis to do that with. But we we also try to make that, and we don't try, we make it into a kind of a ceremony light. We um, we uh, start make it into a, you know a hit hit a Tibetan gong to start the uh, the evening, and we mm. sit in silence for a few minutes. Uh, we dedicate our smoking to um, people who we feel like could use a blessing or whatever, like I put out a prayer, and then we have like two puffs on a on my vaporizer, and I mean we're talking you know high THC stuff. So, you know, fairly strong experience. Uh, and then we'll sit uh, in silent meditation for another five to 10 minutes and then play music for 45 minutes or so and then repeat that process. But I also like to just be alone with the plant. So that's why I do it that other time most weeks anyway. And um, and I notice if, uh, you know, typically what I'll do is I'll just, you know, a little simpler than what I just described with my friend. I will... Um, just uh, thank the plant, uh, you know, say, you know, Bom, Bom Shiva, Bom Shankar, or Santa Maria, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, um, I'll have a couple of puffs, maybe one even, um, and to start with at least. And then I'll just sit uh, uh, like in meditation posture. And, uh, and, you know, thoughts will come up because I've, I've got a pretty active mind. I, I, I have quite an imagination. There's always ideas coming up. And especially if I'm working on a project right then, you know, so, but I, you know, generally I try to, um, it varies. It, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go with that kind of line of thinking for a while just because it's quite fruitful. Um, but uh, a lot of the times what I'll do is I'll um, just jot down a line or two and, you know, tell myself to come back to it later. Um, because really what you have to do is get out of your own way. This is the sit down, shut up and pay attention idea. You know, that um, with cannabis, as I say, if you fill your space, your, in, your mental space, as it were, uh, you can ignore it to a large degree, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, even if I, I also will sometimes pick up the guitar and play a little music, and I notice if I'm 
focusing the energy into playing the guitar. I don't notice the power of the high nearly as much as if I just stop, like literally I'll put the guitar down, sit in silence, and I'll go, oh, yes, <laughs> it's really <laughs> strong. <laughs> um, um, so it, it has this potential, this ego-dissolving kind of potential um, uh, that you have to pay attention to, you have to be there for it, and it's a... Um, I, it's not only this, but I think of it as a um, an energy medicine that, um, well, a favorite quote of mine, if I've got it more or less correct, is uh, I think I put it in the book. Um, it's by a, a, a French, um, uh, I think he was a Christian mystic or something um, from the early, maybe early 20th century. His name's Tyhard de Chardin. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I quoted him in, in the Cannabis and Spirituality book saying, physical energy must be mastered for spiritual energy to manifest or spiritual realization to manifest. Um, and so cannabis works that way. Uh, it, uh, or it can certainly work that way, um, that you open the body and the mind and the body open together. If you, quiet, if you can quiet the mind, uh, at least for part of the time, it's not easy for almost anyone to quiet the mind continuously with or without cannabis, period, you know. But um, if, you can, if you can create those gaps and just really pay attention, I just feel this, I experience this over and over again. That it's like, she, I'll say she uh, can be there fully, you know, mm -hmm. um, you really feel that presence and, and that presence is, um, well, it has a few things going on, but you know, my favorite thing, so to speak, is that it just opens me up into a bigger space that actually feels real. You know, it doesn't feel like you're being distorted into some kind of, you know, altered thing or whatever in a way it's just you're entering more deeply into now, you know, um, mm. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know, so it's not like you're seeing the, you know, the 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 lamp on the on the wall, uh, you know, turn change colors and turn into three different things or whatever. Although the, that can happen if you eat enough of it, but um, uh, but you know, if you're just having a couple of puffs, basically what you have this potential to do is to uh, open the system up, let the let the 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 effect of cannabis open your whole body system up, which is you know on works on your mind in the same way it just calms things down relaxes muscles um joan bellow in the book talks about that and then when you first smoke um <clears throat> you know there's a, a speeding up of the heart which is pumping uh, an increased supply of uh, fresh richly oxygenated blood throughout the whole organism and uh, re re releasing and relaxing what she calls the oppositional muscles or the skeletal muscles um so you're, it's that's what I meant by an energy medicine. You really have to be there for that. You know, if you're not present for it, then you're just going on autopilot or habitual pattern. You know, but if you're actually paying attention to your breath, oh, am I relaxing and releasing my breath? Am I holding my shoulders up? Can I let that go? Can I just sit here and be calm? You know, um, and then it 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 connects you more deeply into um, just appreciating being alive in a sense you know being in the moment um hmm. i could say more about that but you probably have a lot of other questions <clears throat> you know it's it sounds like the central theme is really intention and mm -hmm. presence yes and yes. the two of those things together can create the experience that one prefers to have and um you know that's something that chris and i we always set an intention we'll even mm -hmm. pray over the plant we set an intention and mm -hmm. we'll use specific strains to take us to certain places mm. but also release control mm -hmm. at the same time to mm -hmm. allow space for whatever needs to be seen or received to be mm -hmm. received and yeah then, oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead steven go ahead steven Oh, I was just going to say that uh, regarding intention, um, uh, the way I see it with cannabis, it doesn't have to be, um, it, it doesn't have to be specific like, uh, you know, uh, show me this or show me that or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, like sometimes when you do ayahuasca ceremonies, they say, what is your intention for this one? You know, um, it's to me, it's more the, 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 uh, the general intention to um, awaken, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is just 
putting that you know foundation there to start with rather than just oh i'm just going to have a um, you know a toke i'm going to have a puff you know and do whatever you know um that's you know that kind of casual so-called recreational use is you know potentially really different from you know just giving yourself a space where you can you know quote unquote sit down shut up and pay attention it doesn't mm -hmm. actually have to be sitting down all the time it doesn't have it's not we're not creating any dogma here you know but it's um you know the, the sitting down thing is just kind of like um i don't know it's the it, it, it's the purest way that's why you know there's thousands of years of you know iconography of people sitting in meditation posture they don't usually show them standing up right mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and the reason is because y there are more muscles involved in standing up i'm sure you know whereas if you're sitting down with a straight back uh ganesh uh, baba the crazy wisdom cannabis guru i quoted him in the book too he says there's only two rules that i have he says one is um sit with a straight spine perfectly straight so that energies can move through you, you know? Um, and the other one is dedicate your, your smoking to, in his case, Shiva, but I would say whatever, you know, thank mm -hmm. it, you know, whatever, treat it with respect, what, you know, however that works for you. So, so the idea of sitting down is that you, you don't want to have to be, uh, putting any energy into, you know, holding your position or, you know, anything like that. So in the, in, so that, you know, applies to things like, say, yoga and Tai Chi and a number of other similar kinds of activities, which are also really conducive to using cannabis with. But I always like to say, come back to the wellspring every once in a while, if you're going to do that, you know, because when you don't have to do anything, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't have to think about much when you're doing a yoga asana that you already know, of course, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you can be very, very present, but it's even more simple when you just sit um so it's just that idea of you know um uh having that in general intention i'm going to meet this plant fully i want to see what it can show me um i want to heal that's really important you know just like uh, help please santa maria please uh um uh you know ganja whatever you want to call it help me uh heal help me uh release the chains that <clears throat> that i am bound with you know uh, or bound by and um yeah just that basically yeah you know Stephen. i one i want to really just thank you for t opening up and sharing your thoughts and, and inspirations into using this plant and like Sarah mentioned, the intention, how important that is. But also, you know, you just mentioned something about asking it to help you to release. And mm -hmm. that that point right there is so important because as Sarah mentioned, we often do pray over every time we pray over the plant. And mm -hmm. um, so many, um, so many, not only one realizations, but also the letting go and the surrender to mm -hmm. one's full self in that moment in in your pure authenticity is so magical and and so amazing and it, it's moved me to tears many times um you know both sarah and i using this plant and it's mm -hmm. really just been uh, extremely instrumental in our own personal and inner growth you know mm -hmm. and that Lovely. actually lead, leads me to ask you this, you know, mm -hmm. we all clearly agree that it's a powerful spiritual medicine. Um, mm -hmm. So why do you think even to this day in certain spiritual communities, um, it's still heavily, you know, stigmatized? I mean, mm -hmm. we've met a lot of people from all walks of life that practice a variety of different, um, you know, modalities, religions, spiritual paths, whatever you want to call it. And of course, one person's opinion doesn't reflect the whole, obviously, because mm -hmm. we've met people in and in without that have different opinions, but we'll still find this fear, um, especially in the yogic community. I find that mm -hmm. as well. Oh, don't use drugs because it's not pure if you use anything, even cannabis. What's mm -hmm. your opinion on that? Well, to put it diplomatically, nonsense. <laughs> there's a, Thank you. There's a, there's, a, there's a little five-letter word spelled D-O-G-M-A. Mm -hmm. 
dogma, right? Um, so, um, but it's that's partly sourced in that kind of um, brainwashing, to put it crudely, or conditioning that people have that drugs, you know, there's this kind of old cliche that people in spiritual traditions sometimes, you know, have, which I just don't buy at all, which is, um, you know, that uh, a drug, and this would apply to the psychedelics, any, all the psychedelics from that point of view is that it's, a, it's taking a shortcut, it's cheating, it's, and it's artificial awakening. It's not. These substances are not. They, they, they are opening you, you to what's all, what's real that you're not um, experiencing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And there's, they're, they're not shortcuts because, well, if if they if they were shortcuts that would work that work, then what's wrong with that anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if something works, it works. <laughs> um, but the question is, what works? So I guess probably what the objectors would say would be something like, well, yeah, you have this, you know, lovely experience or whatever it is, but, um, you know, you can't do that 24 hours a day, every day. You have to find your way to, you know, uh, rest or in, in the, in the awakened space. And I completely agree with that. Um, one, you know, so um, one way of looking at cannabis and these other psychedelics is they are um, reminders of what's there for starters. Um, you know that that there is a there is a spiritual power. There is a um, there's a, some vast uh, awakened energy that's that um, transcends anybody's ideas about what that is, and uh, we mo hardly any of us experience that much and so these medicines uh you know open the doors to as it was the doors of perception the old book by um uh, aldous Aldous Huxley. Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah opening the doors of perception yeah he gives it i think in that book he gave a metaphor of a of a, a water faucet you know and that generally are the faucet is just almost turned off completely and there's just this little trickle coming out and the mescaline that he took opened up the faucet into what he called mind at large you know mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I, yeah I, I, I wouldn't presume to know for sure why why there's all that it's a I, you know that that uh, a bias if you will um, uh, but it, but I think you know it's in the realm of a combination of cultural conditioning and this kind of dogmatic purism uh, about you know their own tradition or whatever. Um, and and in fact, with cannabis and probably with the other psychedelics, my guess is that the people who feel that way haven't used them, haven't had the experiences that would make them go, oh, okay, yes, indeed, this can be used this way. I remember reading a, a book on MDMA, and uh, it was a Zen uh, teacher who had been teaching and practicing, you know, for twenty, thirty years, and he said he 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 learned more in one MDMA session than he had in the last thirty years of meditation. Oh know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, but the, but the point is also, uh, you know, do you, do you know who Houston Smith was or is? I guess he's still alive. I don't know. Um, uh, no, no, nope. no. He's um, he's a he's a legendary uh, religious scholar. He taught at some one, one or more of the major universities in the United States, and his textbook on the world's religions—I've forgotten the name of it—was one of the standard textbooks in universities for quite a long time, I believe. Anyway, he also worked with psychedelics um, and well, had experiences with them anyway. And he, I don't remember the exact wording, but he, he's, he's, he's sort of famous <laughs> among people like me anyway, um, for a quote that goes roughly like it's uh, clear that psychedelics can produce a religious experience. It's less clear they can, that they can produce a religious life, right? Mm -hmm. So the other aspect of working with psychedelics and cannabis in, in the same, you know, yes, you have this opening or whatever. Uh, if you meet it that way and get out of your own way and you go, you enter into, the, you know, hesitant to, I don't like to use words cheaply, but when I feel it, I do consider it something like sacred space, you know, holy space, mm -hmm. Um when I enter into that place, it feels real. It feels like a deep appreciation for life altogether, you know, opening up the heart, like you were saying, Chris. And, uh, but then, you know, you're, you're back to base camp two or three hours later. Right. So, um, and, and the kind of the, the, the rub here or the irony almost is that you can't 
do that every day because um you know, for one thing, you're becoming too dependent on having this, you know, little plant to help you, in my opinion. Um, but more than my opinion, <clears throat> there's a distinct tolerance effect if you're doing it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. and, yes. Um, so several of the contributors to the book say a similar thing, which is um, like uh, Ma uh, Mariano uh, uh, da Silva, who's a, both an ayahuasca uh, master and a cannabis master uh, says, um, you know, when I use this plant, Santa Maria, he calls it, um, uh, as a sacrament, uh, it has the ability to uh, bring me into transcendental realms. But he said, if I use it every day, none of that happens, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 there was something else I was going to say about that, but it slipped away for the moment. <laughs> Well, really appreciate you mentioning that because I think that was something we were definitely going to ask you as far as the the usage of that and what that mm. actually means. So really, thank you so much for touching on that. And I also want to bring up, you know, oh, many- wait, wait, sorry. Can oh, I cut in for a second? Please before, do. before we get too far away from it, I just remembered the other part of that that I wanted to say. Uh, so you have these experiences. It's like a reality check in a sense, an inspiration uh, to tap into these places and to get the truth. And that's another thing we should cover at some point is that cannabis also has this truth serum function, but let's leave that one for the moment. Um, so in the, in the, in the life that this is <clears throat> related to the Houston Smith quote of, you know, this less clear that psychedelics and I'll include cannabis in that can produce a religious life. Um, uh, you have these experiences, you're back to base camp after a couple of hours. So, um, what's happening in the long term in your life and this i got kind of sidetracked by this frequency of use issue um uh you can keep tapping back into it keep reminding yourself keep opening yourself that way uh, but ultimately i think a really important way of thinking about the use of this plant for spiritual benefit is that um these experiences are uh training experiences in a sense that um Okay, now I need to back up a little. Uh, the the uh, uh, a fairly simple way of thinking about what spiritual awakening is is um, or the journey of uh, you know going from not awake to awake, so to speak, you know A to Z or Z in your country um, uh, would be uh, at the A or beginning point, um, the, the where you haven't worked with you know, your spiritual development, so to speak, particularly um, your inner development, um, maybe never even thought about that. Most people go around guiding their lives, living their lives according to a set of beliefs and concepts that we've been taking on since the moment we were born, and many people would say from past lives as well. But nonetheless, forming a set of beliefs and concepts about who we are, what we're allowed to be, what we're not allowed to be, what's true or untrue or real or not real or safe or unsafe or all that stuff, but it's all lives in thought. It's all in these thought packages that we put together over the course of our lives. Um, and what spiritual awakening involves is a trajectory from that uh, way of living toward gradually trusting the energies and the intelligence of right now in this moment with all the senses and perceptual abilities that we have in this moment. So, um, you know, that's about relaxing, opening, calming the mind. You know, Buddhism goes into that in great detail, you know, you clear, clear some space in the mind and tune into what's real. Uh, so cannabis um, is a, a handy way to think of it is as a non-specific amplifier, and this is why uh, it's so different depending on you know what you're using it for, and why the intention to use it to channel it into that kind of awakening is so important. Um, so if you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if you're using it for spiritual use. You can't be in that state all the time, of course, as we were just saying, but you're reminding yourself, oh, yes, I can trust perception in this moment. I can relax. I can breathe. I can calm my mind. I can feel, you know, I can let the compassion arise in my heart when I relax things around it and so on. And so it's a retraining or a recalculation, reconfiguring kind of process. Make sense? Well, and 
to support what you're saying to, you know, with the, you know, not using the plant every single uh-huh. day, there needs, yeah. because it reveals so much to us, the mm-hmm. old beliefs and stories, there's that integration process that we need. That's what I mean. Integration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have, you, you, you know, you, you have to practice that, you know, you, you're reminded when you take, you know, use cannabis as a meditation or, you know, spiritual uh, ally that way, how you can be. And then tomorrow, you have to remember to that you can do that. You know, I like I like the way Eckhart Tolle talked about it. You know that book, The Power of Now. Yep. Yes, one of our favorites. <laughs> yeah, fact, well, it's Sarah's. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, well, when I somebody recommended his book uh, to me, you know, years ago, and I'd been involved with Tibetan Buddhism for quite a long time, and when I first started to read it, I thought, oh, this is Buddhism dumbed down. But then, um, I, as I got into it, I changed my mind and decided it was um, it was the basic under the core understanding of what Buddhism is trying to teach, but just without all that sort of elaboration, you know. So it wasn't dumbed down; it was just sort of simplified, <clears throat> you know, in, in in expression. But um, one of my favorite things from him was that he said. The ideal relationship you want with your, he just called it your mind, but I I would call it your thinking mind, Buddhists call it a discursive mind, is that you can treat it as a tool that you can, that when you need to use it, you pick it up and use it. But when you don't need it any longer for, you know, a specific purpose, um, you can put it down. He claimed he could sit, you know, in meditation for an hour or two without a thought, really, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So... That's this is where the integration part is is uh, um, practicing the daily walk. You know, my old Buddhist teacher Chogyam Trungpa talked about the the walk of an elephant, like one foot in front of the other. You're in the world. You're you're in your body. You're aware. You know, again, you know, autopilot takes over. Habitual pattern takes over if you're not present. Um, uh, but if you're if you're able to go, okay, what's my mind doing right now? Okay, do I need to be thinking now? Not really. I'm walking. Why don't I just walk? You know, I'm walking to the store, you know, washing the dishes. Same same Buddhist teacher said, uh, wisdom or enlightenment is as much about making a proper cup of tea as anything else, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that we do some exotic things. It's that we just learn to calm down and open up and be present and dignified and graceful in the moment, no matter what we're doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what I meant by the retraining aspect of working with cannabis because of its amplifying capability. It deepens our entry into that space potentially. Again, if we can calm our minds for part of the time and are quiet our minds, I mean, uh, and then we, you know, the next day we have to go get up in the morning and, you know, be present. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned, two key words, one uh, being an amplifier and two being a truth serum. And for, Mm. for many people um, we know, and we've talked to, and I'm sure you have over the years of they reporting anxiety, panic attacks, Mm. and fear when they use cannabis. And Mm -hmm. of course we have our own personal interpretations about why this exactly happens, Mm -hmm. but we would love for you to share kind of what you feel is going on when someone experiences discomfort with using the plant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely have um, takes on that. Uh, okay, full sort of as a precursor, so to speak, to what I, the main thing I want to say about that, uh, it, it can depend on the strain, you know. Um, uh, the, I, I think in general, the you know strong sativa strains tend to be more like that than the indica strains. Mm-hmm. However, I actually prefer working with the sativa leaning strains for the for myself and also for the ceremonies that I lead uh, because they have that more expansive. They tend to, you know, so it's way more complicated than that, and the terpenes are involved and so on and so on. But um, uh, they tend to have that more airy, ethereal, spacious. Um, up sort of quality, you know? Um, so I usually use hybrids that lean to the sativa side of things. Um, although recently uh, I've started to combine strains and that's turning out to be pretty interesting as well. That's what Daniel McQueen does. The guy that I mentioned, he combines a number of different strains. So, um, the last ceremony I did, I combined three strains, one that 
this is what the dispensary told me anyway, one that leans a little to the Indica side, like maybe four, you know, 60, 40 on that side. Another one that's about 60, 40 towards sativa and another one that's more over more like uh, 80, 20 on the sativa side. And, and somehow that, um, balances the effects, uh, you know, the particular chemical components of the three uh, for some pretty sharp and opening work. Wow. Uh, how, yeah. how brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And he has this other thing that, uh, you know, maybe you'll see his book when it comes out. Um, he, I can't remember how, you know, folks listening to this, please don't, you know, quote me directly on this. It's just what I remember from reading the book a couple of months ago was that he, he, uh, he, this is what he calls the sort of secret ingredient, I think. And he says, um, uh, it's, uh, a more of a prevalence of CBN, uh, N as in Norman. Um, uh, and he said, for example, if you take, uh, some bud that you have and you leave it, I think he said in the sun or something like that for a couple of months, what'll happen is it'll start going through a chemical composition change and to start to produce or have more CBN in it. And he claims that somehow get, getting that into the mix is, is partly what's creating these more psychedelic effects for him wow. um, when he, when he does it with ceremonies and all that. So anyway, there's the strain issue, right? And then of course there's the dosage issue uh, and especially with the really high THC content these days. But what that points to is the, is the nub of the issue. And in, in my view, and I suspect you guys are already on board with that understanding as mm -hmm. well. If in fact, cannabis is an ego dissolver and a truth serum um uh then okay so forget the truth serum part of it for a moment here um if if it's an amplifier and it's amplifying your opening into the real the, you know when i talked earlier about this notion that you know that the beginning of the journey is where you're living your whole life through um, a set of concepts that you've you know, gradually formed and taken on since you were born. Um, and that's what Buddhists would, and others traditions presumably would call the ego, uh, um, which, is, which they say is an illusion. You know, um, It's an illusion that we are separate from everything. And it's like we've built a fortress. And so we think that's real. Is this is what we put together to survive with, and so we're deeply attached to to this thing. It's not a, this is not a moral judgment or anything. It's just a kind of mechanical reality, almost. You know, <laughs> that this is what human beings do: is we we create these uh, what um, uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, one of his main students, Otto Rank, called the lie of personality. Others have called it the false or provisional personality. This is this ego, this character we form you know it's like a char character in a movie or something like that and yes we have all, t all these different tendencies that are natural to us and so on but this story about who we are and what's real isn't mm. it's just exists in thought right so um uh if you meet cannabis even if you don't come in with the intention you know to wake up with it it can um dissolve that you know, it can undercut that. This is, well, I guess this is the truth serum quality. I mean, I was thinking of when I said, forget that for a moment, I was thinking of the truth serum aspect as being like the way it can shine a light on, you know, uh, you know, some of your behaviors and stuff that maybe could use some work, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it does do that and it, um, or it can do that. And, um, and, and it's a shock, you know, I, I've ex experienced that myself. Um, Maybe I'll just take, tell you a brief anecdote about that that might be instructive. Way back when, in my 20s, um, we had some brownies, cannabis brownies, and they were pretty strong. And we were at a party, um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, uh, I, it was quite strong, and I, I had, at the time, a, you know, a well-developed ego in the sense, not like I was an egotist or anything, but in the sense of um, I had a public persona, you know, that I trotted out for public consumption, so to speak. Um, and what happened that night was I couldn't find it. I couldn't connect to it. I couldn't relate to it. I could not do it. I could not be that character. I just simply could not. And, um, and did I like that? No, I did not like that at all. I, I felt distressed by the fact that I couldn't connect with my way of being with people because I didn't have anything 
more authentic or real to fall back on that I've ever had ever experienced. And so I, I, I remember going over and sitting on a chair and just feeling kind of depressed, you know, and not talking to anybody. And a, a friend came over um, and sat down beside me and she said, what's going on? And um, I said, you know, I told her what happened basically. And she said, well, you know, I like you better this way. <laughs> you're, you're real now, right? You know, a lot of people don't want to experience, you know, that's a threat, right? That's, this is where the, this is what, this is the answer to this question in my understanding is this mm-hmm. is where the fear and the paranoia come in. Paranoia is, uh, as I understand it, um, just fear with an elaborate story, right? Mm-hmm. You know, wow. paranoia is like, that. oh, there's a, th- there's a threat, right? It's an anticipation of a threat. It's not a real threat. Doesn't mean the police aren't following you, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's your attitude about the police following you that's what's going on there, um, uh, and so um, uh, you're feeling vulnerable. You're f- feeling your your game exposed. That's what happened to me that night. My 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 game was exposed, and that was disturbing, you know. And and so people feel that, and they go, "Oh no, don't want to go there." Mm-hmm. That's why a lot of people don't like cannabis. Um, because it makes them vulnerable, um, and and they don't want it. They're not comfortable with with that with that change, with that threat to their to the status quo. You might say, right? Mm-hmm. And by the way, that's also one of the okay. So that the, you know, e- ego is the most ruthless thing on the planet. Um, you know, and again, this is not. I don't mean this as a sort of a moral judgment. It's just a fact. Is that the ego part of us is the part of us that that is absolutely insistent, determined to keep the fortress um, tight, you know, and un, unvulnerable, um, invulnerable. And um, so if we only identify with that part of us, then anything that threatens that is that. It's a threat, you know, so it, 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 it creates a fear reaction, you know, take you out of your comfort zone. We hear that term so often, right? Um and so the paranoia, as I say, is just an elaborate, uh, you know, narrative that you know, one generates around it. So what I was going to say is that the thinking mind is ego's primary strategy for avoiding reality. And that's why, you know, traditions like Buddhism say, you know, you have to let go of thinking because um, that's like throwing up an ink cloud of obscuration between you and unconditioned reality. So the so, you know, the mind can get really busy and cannabis, you know, because it's an amplifier can get the mind going even more that way. Right. Um, which is a really interesting one in itself because there's the creative side of thinking and then there's the obscuration side. And some, it's often hard to know how the two are not the same, you know, or mm-hmm. they're, you know, having that same function of avoiding reality, so to speak. But the other one that I wanted to mention is, um, uh, well, the fear and paranoia thing, but there's also the physical thing, which is also as in my understanding, I think this is true, um, uh, that, uh, another way of, um, not being able to let go is the body then experiences, uh, the body itself experiences symptoms. And again, this is what I mentioned way back at the beginning of our con- uh, conversation about how the, the newbies to ayahuasca ceremonies and the peyote ceremonies tend to be the ones who get sick and dizzy and all that because they haven't learned how to uh, be with, stay centered, stay calm, and open up to and surrender to the medicine. So um, uh, and I just had a ceremony a week or two ago where a woman experienced this, and uh, <laughs> she w- she was pretty much she was new to cannabis basically um and and i had done a little survey and she said she was new to it and i said okay be careful you know this is fairly strong stuff i would suggest you have one toke and then you know five or ten minutes later i'll ask you again uh, or i'll ask the group again or, you know you know where you're you're not going to go any higher from that toke if you want another one or two you know if you if if you have a you know high tolerance you know and you can know you can go way deeper go for it but start slow you know, be careful. Well, we we had to go outside and because uh, we couldn't smoke in this room, and we're standing out on this balcony in a small circle and passing. I started passing joints around, and for some reason, she forgot what I'd said, and she kind of these joints were coming by, and she <laughs> thought, "Oh, I should have another toke." She had three tokes, mm. um, and she was uh, nauseous and dizzy the whole night. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's dosage. You know, it was way more than she could handle. Again, and this is why it's an advanced spiritual medicine because, um, you know, you have to learn, especially in higher doses. You know that that. that you know, they say less is more. Some of the people in the book say that, but that also refers to frequency of use, like we were talking about earlier. But less is more uh, is that you, know, you find out what a comfortable level is. It's not about getting blasted. It's basically, my favorite way of thinking or telling people what the optimal dose for spiritual work is: the dosage in any given encounter with the medicine that you both. Uh, want to and can handle and the can handle part is that you can channel the energy you can let go of it more or less you know you may be challenged uh it's not you know you may be pushed somewhat beyond your 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 you know your uh, sort of physical mental comfort zone and still be able to work with that if you work with it in the way this is what we do in these ceremonies you know we keep coming back to silent meditation i use sound things and different things to get people out of their minds and just relaxing and breathing and i do breath work stuff with them as well i'm not holotropic but just getting them to pay attention to the breath and mm-hmm. you know different things like that so it's all about um working with the energy you know you're given the gift temporarily of this powerful energy to work with um so, yeah, this was a woman who wasn't ready for that. She had no idea what would happen. And, you know, for what it's worth, <laughs> I talked to her the next day and she actually felt like she'd had an amazing experience because she learned um, she learned something in the end about how to trust the medicine. And then also people, were, several women were, were gathering around her even for an hour or two after the ceremony and just really nurturing her. And she just felt loved and mm-hmm. to the whole thing. She just felt like she had this ultimately a transformative experience, but she definitely had too much that night. Mm-hmm. You know, she should have had one modest toke of this strong kind of medicine. This was this three, you know, one to one to one thing that I was telling you about. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, sat with it and if she felt comfortable that she could get out of her head not feel nauseous or dizzy or anything like that then have another one but otherwise just leave it there for that night and maybe the next time start off at that low toke level again and maybe ready to go a little further you know Mm -hmm. everything that you've said over the last 10 minutes is exactly Mm -hmm. why this is such a powerful medicine Mm -hmm. and You know, I want to just share really quickly, one of the things that I personally like to use as Mm -hmm. an amplifier is if there's something going on in my life where I'm feeling Mm -hmm. anxious or fearful, um, you know, as a personal development coach, I know that anxiety is just a messenger. It's not the enemy. It's trying to signal something's off balance. So sometimes if for some reason I'm having a difficult time processing or getting to that root cause of this Mm -hmm. anxiety or fear, I will commune Mm -hmm. with the plant and specifically ask for it to highlight and amplify Mm. this anxiety for me to find that root. And it's not fun. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And every time I go to that point, it's a terrifying Mm -hmm. experience, but the Mm. layers just pull off and pull off and pull off. And I've never not found the root any time I've ever used cannabis in this way. And it's just like this big weight is released from my shoulders. And I wish mm-hmm. that we lived in a culture that wasn't so fearful of their anxiety, mm-hmm. that they could lean into it, lean into the pain, amplify mm-hmm. it so that they mm-hmm. can find what it is within them that they have mm-hmm. forgotten or you know, Mm -hmm. what it, the old story it is that they're telling themselves is no longer Mm -hmm. true. Um, And Mm -hmm. so I love everything you've said. And I just wanted to Mm -hmm. add that little sprinkle on top in case anybody was like, Ooh, maybe I should Mm -hmm. try that if you feel safe. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, that's lovely. And I, uh, you know, I really liked what you said about, you know, the, the sort of lack of cultural understanding about, about how to work with the mind that way. And it reminded me of a, um, you know, the, the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism that I, particularly the way I got them through a fellow named Chugyam Trungpa, um, were so positive. That was one of the things I always remember when I was involved with that community. This is all so positive. There's no moral judgment here or anything. It's just about how to work with your mind. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite sayings from him was, well, actually, it's the it's not so much a saying as it was, um, I can try to be as brief as possible with this, the way that I was taught uh, was that they called the three yana 
path. Yana means vehicle. So it was Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. The Hinayana came first, and that was just sit down, shut up, and pay attention, just the simple follow the breath meditation to tame the mind as much as possible. Learn how to see that thoughts aren't real other than in the moment that they come in, and then you can let them go and come back to being in the now, right? Then the Mahayana was uh, real, starting to realize that that's just the beginning, you know, which we're, we're not here just to, you know, heal ourselves. We're starting to recognize that we have a heart and we can use it to help other people. But then the Vajrayana stage, and there were practices associated with each of these uh, stages of the path, um, was that um, no, no kind of plan or agenda at all, really, just working with energies. And so he had this saying, which was, um, the uh, it was called the lion's roar. That's what it was. The f and, and the lion's roar is the fearless proclamation that any state of mind is workable, which is essentially what I'm saying about how one can potentially work with cannabis is that um, stuff comes up. If you don't buy into a thought line about it and you just work with the, again, energy medicine of the plant, <clears throat> letting the you know letting yourself come back to being present then her energy medicine her teaching so to speak is at that non-cerebral level and that she's teaching you how to trust trust is such a key word you know trust mm. nowness trust your own uh, body's uh, you know connectedness to the earth and your own mind's ability to to uh, discern things they called it what do they call it um, discriminating awareness you know it's not about seeing filtering anything through concepts it's just about using this innate intelligence that we have to see to just truly see almost with a capital s right um so yeah just that idea that uh that um ultimately you know that's the aspiration anyway is that any state of mind is workable, you know, and because you can transmute it. That's what they, that's the Vajrayana path. They talk about trans, the, the path quality of the Vajrayana stage. Um, I was ta taught, I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say I realized all this by any means, but um, was that the, the practitioner, so to speak, is learning to uh, open up into increasingly powerful energies over time and learn how to not resist them, not fear them, but allow them to move through. And then you transmute them by letting them go. And then that actually adds to your the the force, so to speak, of your awakening. Mm. Make sense? Wow. The, yeah. I'm feeling it through my body. That that That's extremely powerful. And I need to mm. dive into this a little bit deeper off air uh, for sure. That, mm. that really, sure. really spoke yeah. to me a lot. And so we're at this point right now in our, you know, collective um, oneness, I guess, and heading into that mm -hmm. direction. But where... Where do you see the future headed regarding cannabis? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and to second part that, how can we all ensure that we uphold the integrity of this plant moving forward? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure how to put that into words exactly. Um, well, okay, so a couple of the people in the book refer to cannabis as the sacrament of peace because of the qualities we've been talking about. I don't think I need to reiterate that potential mm -hmm. um, just you know, for, for time-wise at this point of our conversation. Um, it has this potential to calm us down, open our hearts, bring us into the real, you know, into the moment. Um, and, uh, and so we're retraining ourselves over time. And so it's a, it's a wonderful sacrament that way when it's used that way. So basically, you know, I think, one answer to your question, Chris, is uh, that I would that I would offer is that um, for uh, survival on this planet um, over the you know coming decades and centuries, the whole species needs to become spiritualized. Um, we need to find we need to recognize who we are. And you know, there's lots of different ways to to say what that is, and I do, I, I haven't I wouldn't say that I fully realized it. So I'm sure there are ways in which I don't understand it, you know, uh, with 100% clarity. But I think I do understand enough to know that again, it's about trust of the moment and trust of the intelligence that we have, calming the mind down and being present and moving through the world with with this kind of grace, you know. Um, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, you know, the more people that can get that, 
the more likely we are to come through um, what is inevitably going to be a great disruption to the old ways. This this is a whole other story. We could talk about this for half an hour. <laughs> yes, but, we can. Um, th- this is actually the bottom line here. This is the the, the kind of you know, foundation of the whole thing is that that um, the karma of the world has reached the end essentially you know um just for whatever reason because of the numbers of people on the planet and the sort of massive digging up of the planet etc 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 um this is not on anymore it's you know it's just it's going down and uh the, the only thing that's going to pull us through is a massive spiritual awakening that connects more and more people to our true relationship because then we start to realize that we are not separate you know that the ego part of us was this illusion that's what they say over and over again in Buddhist teachings. It doesn't exist other than as a series of stories. And when you can let go of the stories and calm down and relax and be present, then you start to realize that you feel. So I, one, one way I like to think of it is as you we're learning to feel the world rather than think it, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Like feel it doesn't mean, I don't mean just like feel, you know, happy, sad, angry, whatever. I mean, feel like musicians say feel, you know, you feel the music, right? You feel the world. Um, you feel your connection to it. You start recognizing that you know you've put these boundaries or these you know walls around yourself and that have created this you know separation and the unreal part of it is that it can do it can dissolve it can be dissolved you know it's a long journey but um it can be and this is what's going to connect more people to i just somebody just sent me an article the uh, the other day saying um uh, something like, I didn't, I didn't actually read it. It was just a title. I get things sent, you know, links or whatever. And somebody sent one that said something like, uh, psychedelics, um, the, you know, more use of psychedelics is going to, um, is going to help with uh, climate change, you know? And, um, and yes, of course, because what they can do when they're done right, uh, is, dissolve that boundary and make us realize that we are connected to all this. We are connected to Gaia, the living earth. We're connected to the plants. We're connected to, I'm getting choked up about that one. You know, we're connected to each other. We're, we're, you know, we're part of God in that sense. Um, We are the creators, you know? Um, And so this is our planet. We have to look after it. We have to look after each other. We have to have a reciprocal relationship with this planet and, um, that's what's going to pull us through this next period of time. Mm. I feel that. I feel that. Yeah. Wow. So cannabis can participate in that, absolutely. It, you know, it's the people's plant. It's the most accessible of all the psychedelics. And when used, you know, effectively, <clears throat> can be both. It, it has a unique quality among the psychedelics, isn't it? it? It's both powerful and gentle at the same time. That even when it's powerful, it has a gentle way of bringing you in. Um, this is the energy medicine part of it, right? Um, uh, you know, some of these other psychedelics, uh, even if you're completely surrendered to them, there's 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 a you know there's a real uh, almost electrified energy to them in a way. You know, um, uh, they're they're like thunder gods almost. You know, whereas cannabis is as though it does have that you know kind of male quality to it as well warrior quality because it's teaching us to be strong that's part of what entering into the moment more is like becoming grounded and dignified and having your head upright you know and and being yourself and uh, connecting to that and uh, so that's the spiritual warrior quality which has a male and a female together component but it definitely has a male energy as well but the but it's its style, so to speak, is more of what I would call a feminine energy, in that it's teaching us to uh, to um, connect to those. Excuse me, somebody's calling. I'll just turn that off. Um, uh, uh, just teaching us to uh, surrender, you know, mm-hmm. surrender the sort of the tough uh, barriers that we put up there. Beautiful, beautifully put. Very well said. This conversation, Stephen, has been one of the most inspirational conversations. You know, of course, you know, most of our listeners know that Sarah and I uh, go 
go down the rabbit hole quite easily, but, you know, mm-hmm. oftentimes off air together, you know, we stay up for hours just uh, exploring the, our consciousness and exploring life mm-hmm. together and uh, having these conversations outside of just ourselves and outside of our, our environment at home is deeply uh, enriching. enriching and it feels so mm-hmm. good. My soul is alive after mm-hmm. having this conversation with you this evening. Do you have any updates or anything you'd like to share with our viewers where they can follow you, etc. cetera? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I have a website, which uh, I confess I don't pay much attention to, but there mm-hmm. are 20 or 25 or so essays and articles, mostly by me, but occasionally um, I've had guest guest, uh, you know, blog posts or whatever. Um, so there's that. There's some interesting information there. Um, I'm, I've, I pay a quite a lot of attention to uh, my Facebook group, Cannabis and Spirituality. So the website is CannabisAndSpirituality.com. Pretty easy to remember. And the Facebook group is Cannabis and Spirituality. And um, Facebook's kind of a funny thing because it's very alive in the moment, but then stuff passes away pretty quickly because other stuff piles on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But uh, I I do share things a fair fair amount there. Or or somebody will send – I'll see something on my timeline or whatever and I'll go, Oh, that's pretty interesting. So I'll share it and then I'll, um, I'll add a comment or something. So I'm pretty active on Facebook in that, in that way. And, you know, if people are sincere and really want to write me and ask me a question, um, uh, sometimes I feel like, really, should I do this? But I'm, you know, I'm okay with it. Uh, if they could, if they could actually email me, you know, and that would be Stephen Gray Medicine at gmail dot com. So Stephen with a ph and G R A Y S T E P H E N G uh, G R A Y Medicine at gmail dot com. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we really appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure I encourage people to, to join that group and reach out. Um, and thank you again for this lovely evening. Really appreciated all of your wisdom and knowledge that you've brought to the table. And we're looking forward to the next conversation because I have a feeling this might happen again and going deeper down the rabbit hole. Oh, you're most welcome. And yeah, there's a number of uh, of the topics even in the book that we didn't cover. Um, we didn't uh, we didn't go into the ways that you can work with it in ceremony, for example. We didn't talk much about dosage or methods of intake, for example. Um, we didn't talk about uh, how it can cannabis uh, in an even more advanced way, uh, so to speak. Um, can be an adjunct to working with some of the other psychedelics. It can both uh, potentiate their effects as well as smooth or soothe them without mitigating or diminishing them. Um, uh, so there's things like that. And that comes back to that whole dogma thing too. I just want, you know, let me just end with this, if I may. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <clears throat> What I was saying a few minutes ago is that we agreed we could have talked about almost for the whole hour is that um, we're at a we're at an an unbelievably rare moment in in fact I'd say unique moment in in human history where you know there have been you know times of major change in the past but never have we filled up the planet before the way we have now and that the whole uh, that the ego has dominated the planet you know the illusion of that materialism is going to save you or you know all that stuff and the disconnect from the planet that allows people to dig it up and do all these things to it as if it's just a garbage dump or something you know or just a just like a store where we can go and fill our pockets um uh this is going to be coming apart quite quickly and it would take a long time to explain uh you know why I I feel that, but it's certainly not me that's saying this, and it's not a doomsday thing. It's just inevitable, tr- you know, trajectory of what's what's happening right now. So, um, uh, dog, it's too late for dogma. In other words, cannabis and the other psychedelics have immense potential to cut through, to be really direct and really powerful, and help people wake up. You know with the integration that we've been talking about, of course, you know, bring it back into the daily walk, but um, they are the most direct and powerful teachers and they're announcing their presence much more directly uh, at this very moment. Um, Psilocybin is almost getting legalized here and there, you know, Mm -hmm. for example, you know, cannabis is kind of like the, the, the door opener for a lot of these other 
substances to start getting the kind of recognition they need and deserve. So please, folks, if you're in yoga, and by the way, really briefly, um, yoga has ancient traditions of connection to cannabis. Um, D. Dusso in her chapter in my book talks about that, you know, that, you know, a couple thousand years ago was quite normal and even much more recently for those two uh, kind of practices as you would, if you will, um, to be intermingled, you know? Um, uh, so it, this is no time for saying, Oh no, you can't mix, you know, meditation and cannabis or meditation and, you know, ayahuasca or yoga and this and blah, 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 blah. You know, we are, we're in a, in a, you might say, a war footing right now. We need to bring all of our resources. This is going to happen, I think, you know, eventually. Um, we're going to start realizing that that um, it's like being in a war footing, the, the war against the destruction of the planet, um, that we need to bring all our resources and have a completely open mind about what tools are available to us. That's what I wanted to end with. Mm. Perfect. Yes, 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 yes. And I am so excited for our next conversation. Yeah, we'll I'm, call this one part one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. Anytime, folks. Sounds wonderful. Well, I hope you have a beautiful night and uh, we will definitely be talking to you soon. Yes, thank you. And it's been very nice to talk with that. You know, I know I did most of the talking, but I guess that was the purpose, right? Exactly. But um, <laughs> I, I appreciated your um, occasional, um, uh, you know, participation and got a really good sense from you just from meeting you this way and, you know, your respect for this plant as well. You know, sometimes the people interview me, that's no, no, you know, nothing against them, but they'll, they'll say, oh, well, I don't really use that plant. But then, then they'll just, they're curious, you know, sure. um, uh, but you got, you folks uh, clearly have established a healthy relationship with it. So that's really nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you so much again, Stephen. We'll definitely resume with part two in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. What an instrumental interview this has been for assisting the evolution of our consciousness regarding cannabis and the ways in which it can be used as a powerful spiritual medicine ally. Stephen has done so much work on this subject, as you can clearly tell, and his life is benefiting because of it. Our lives are benefiting because of it and many, many other people's as well. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Remember, if you liked it, please share it. Share on Instagram at Soul and Wonder Love or share on Facebook at Soul and Wonder Inc. Subscribe, leave a review, whatever your little heart fancies. Get this word out there. You are part of helping change the world simply by sharing conscious media. So jump on board with us. Let's get this message out there. Have fun and maybe explore some cannabis in a safe, controlled environment. See you guys for part two. 